bow your head in prayer with me this morning. Father, you are Lord, you are God and King, you are ruler of this universe. You are all powerful and mighty. Nothing happens in this world without your knowledge. And God, you, as that King and as that Lord, you still care for your people. You still care for people like us that deserve nothing of your care. You show kindness and mercy and grace to us, especially in Jesus Christ. We thank you for your son. We thank you for the hope that we have in life because of the new covenant, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, which allows our sin to be atoned for, allows our sin to be covered, such that if we repent and believe and have faith, that you will accept us into heaven, into the new heavens and the new earth. God, we are so grateful for that this morning. Grateful. And we bring ourselves before the scriptures this morning in light of that gospel. It's only in light of that gospel that this sermon, that the scripture can, can really have meaning for us and can transform us. It's only because of Christ and the Holy Spirit that this gathering together has meaning and purpose. Please use this sermon, use the reading of your scripture, your word, for the sake of building up the body of Christ. Open our hearts and minds this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin with an image, but I want to begin by putting an image into your mind. I want you to think about a young man, a young man maybe in, in a day uh, before our day currently. A young man often carries a picture with him of, of his girlfriend. These days it might look like an a iPhone picture on the, the background of his phone, but for the sake of this image, think about an earlier day before phones. As these, this couple is dating, he may take a picture with him wherever he travels. He has a small picture in, in, in a frame maybe, or maybe he has something that he sticks in his billfold. He, and everywhere he goes, he, he uses this picture to remind himself of the beauty of his girlfriend. This picture is greatly important to him. But imagine that when he, when he inevitably marries this girl, this picture, the same picture changes in value. The picture is exactly the same, but the significance of the picture changes. I can illustrate by this. Imagine that if on the couple's honeymoon, he unpacks his suitcase and sets up the same picture beside his bedside table on their wedding night. How ridiculous would that be? He has the real thing. He has the object of his desire now beside him, his wife. The picture has not changed, but he has the real thing now. The two-dimensional image is nothing compared to the beautiful wife. In a similar way, this morning, Paul is going to urge us to shift our focus from an image to the reality, from the shadow to the substance. That's what's going to go on here. We're going to come back to this image, so just keep that in your mind. This, we're going and making our journey through the book of Colossians each more, each week. And this morning we're going to be going through Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 23. As we approach this passage, remember, we must keep in mind all that we've read up until this point. We can't just leave that behind. We've got to carry that with us to help us understand what we're reading. We can't simply yank this section of verses out of the book and expect to be able to understand them without first already understanding what's been said. Just like all other of Paul's letters, Colossians was written in response to a certain situation. It was written in response to a certain situation. Paul is targeting specific issues. He's, he's correcting specific errors. And, and from the text, we've seen that he's concerned about their focus on Christ. 
Mainly that they're not focusing on Christ. And he's trying to set their minds and their faith back upon the central nature of Jesus and the gospel. Others, false teachers, had led them to believe that they must comply with certain forms of worship. They must comply with certain calendar days of worship and things like the Sabbath. Paul is concerned that they're being deceived. And he's writing to convince them of their transformation, being made alive together with Christ. That their sins have already been forgiven and that their record of debt has already been canceled on the cross. These spiritual truths for the believer now demand a worship of Christ and only Christ. Rituals, regulations, mystical experiences and visions were being required of the Colossians. And Paul is rejecting them because Christian worship is centered only upon Jesus. So if you will, open your Bibles with me to Colossians chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 16 through 23. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 23. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you die to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you are still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch referring to things that all perish as they were used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. The text we're covering today is one of the most explicit concerning the Colossian error, concerning what the Colossians have begun to believe that is false. So we're really getting an insight into what the false teaching was doing, what they were saying, what they were requiring of these Colossian believers. Paul reveals to us that the false teachers were passing judgment on them. They were disqualifying them and insisting on asceticism. We'll cover that term in just a minute. The teachers are not just teaching these things, but the Colossians had even really started to participate in these things. Clear by what he says. So Paul responds to the error most directly here in this chapter. And his main point is this. The main point for us this morning is to disregard human commands that do not foster true growth in Christ, who is the fulfillment of the law and head of the church. Disregard human commands that do not foster true growth in Christ, who is the fulfillment of the law and head of the church. Now let's walk through these verses. Let's see where we're getting this main idea from. Let's go back to verse 16. Look down, if you will, again. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. So he's giving us the idea of what the false teachers had beginning to demand of them, right? We're seeing the error that's being pushed by the false teachers with this verse. And, and we can see that it has something to do with dietary laws, things that they must eat or must not eat or must drink or must not drink. They're seeing that they're, they're being held to some observance of some calendar, some ritual calendar, observance of new moons. And this calendar obviously had a distinctly Jewish flavor as there is an emphasis upon the Sabbath itself. Many commentators spend a great deal of time trying to figure out what exactly this false teaching is. What was it? Were they Judaizers, people simply trying to get them to obey the Old Testament law? Were they mystics trying to get people to focus on these religious experiences to build up their own religious thoughts? Were they simply synchronistic pagans where they were grabbing different things from different religions in order to create something completely unique? Defining who they are is not of primary importance, though, because the text still communicates its meaning clearly. They clearly have some elements of syncretism. 
right? They're clearly taking the things of Christ and the gospel and they're adding to them things. And we know that at least some of these things are from the Old Testament. Dietary laws, observance of the Sabbath. And Paul's rebu rebuke is clear. And this is really the main point of verses 16 through 18. Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law. Christ is the, Old Test is the fulfillment of the Old Testament law. Don't any let anyone pass judgment on you concerning these things because he says what? That they are a shadow of the things to come. These false teachers are serving as religious umpires. They're serving as the ones calling things in and out of bounds. And they do not have the right rule book. Christ is the fulfillment and the substance belongs to him. He is the rule book. So this tells us something deeply important about the law itself. Something deeply important about the Old Testament in general, particularly how it relates to us. And it's this, that the Old Testament law is revelatory, not regulatory. The Old Testament law is revelatory, not regulatory. Meaning that from the new covenant perspective, from the covenant that we are a part of in and through Christ, we do not go back to the law and simply apply it as Israel did. It has changed through the gift of Jesus. It applies to us differently now as we are not Israel in the same exact way. Yes, we are Israel the church, but now we are through the blood of Christ. Dr. Quarles, a seminary professor and Southeastern puts it this way. Paul warned that the false teachers completely misunderstood the purpose of Old Testament laws and practices. They were not a means to salvation or even a means of pursuing personal holiness and greater intimacy with God. They were pictures of the coming Messiah, his ministry, his people and the spiritual blessings that he would lavish on his followers. So listen to this. The Old Testament sacrificial system, it wasn't just about being a sacrificial system. No, it anticipated Jesus' death as the supreme and effective sacrifice. Next, the Sabbath. The Sabbath rest pictured that believers had given up on their efforts to work for their salvation, to keep the law, and now rest in His grace alone. The laws of, of separation and distinct diet that the Jews observed prevented them from becoming too engaged in pagan culture and served to remind believers that they were not to ally themselves too closely with unbelievers. Christ is what the Old Testament anticipated. So when we go back to it, we must understand that. We must, we must read the Old Testament in light of Jesus and in light of the new. Jesus even told his disciples that all of Scripture is about him in Luke chapter 24. Sometimes it may be hard to see how some obscure Old Testament law relates to us. It may be hard to understand what it even meant back in the day and its purpose. But as we go back and read our entire Bible, which we must be doing, we must read with an awareness that Christ and the gospel is the primary storyline of Scripture. Christ and the gospel is the primary storyline of Scripture. Ephesians 1.10 says that all things will be united in Jesus. That's where the fullness of time was working for the coming of Christ. See those things as a shadow of the substance of Christ. One of the guys I read said this, A shadow has no permanent reality apart from the body which projects it. You must understand, Jesus isn't going away. Jesus is the substance and not the shadow. Whereas the Old Testament laws, the sacrificial system, the sacrificial calendar is all gone, but only because it was always planned to simply be a shadow. All of those things in the Old Covenant were only meant to ever be a shadow. Jesus is not the shadow. He is the one that will not fade away. In verse 18, Paul develops a picture of the false teaching. He says this, Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind. Apparently these religious umpires, religious referees, required what Paul considered asceticism. Now asceticism, this would be practices that require severe self-discipline, usually from all types of indulgences. So maybe some types of asceticism would be maybe an intense type of fasting. Maybe it would be abstinence from wine. Maybe it would be uh, abstinence from wine, which was really a primary drink in the ancient world. And perhaps it would be, asceticism would mean restriction, restrictions on sexual unions within even the marriage covenant. Now, 
they were not simply requiring ascetic practices. But what else does it say? It says they worshipped angels. It says they told dramatic stories about visions that they received. All of this led the false teachers to, to have a false humility. They were puffed up. It says they thought that they had great spiritual achievements. They, they were placing themselves above the Colossians as their teachers and leaders as they said, look at this experience that I've had. Look at, the, look at this vision that I've had. Let me tell you about this. Let me place myself above you, gain religious superiority, and then demand that you do the same. And they were, they were deceived by this. Instead of worshiping Christ, they started worshiping angels. Instead of following the commands of Christ, they started to follow their own practices and rules that they were making up. Instead of looking to Christ in all of Scripture, they sought visions and made them prideful. Ironically, their religious practices that they created for themselves drove them away from Christ. They wanted to be more spiritual, but yet they were departing from the Holy Spirit Himself. They did not see Christ as the fulfillment of the Old Testament law. They did not also see that Christ is the head of the church. That's what we see in verse 19. Verse 19 clearly communicates that Jesus is the head of the church. So not only is Jesus the, the fulfillment of the old, He is also the head of the new. Verse 19 says this, "...not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God." The rules, the practices, the divisions induced by these false teachers were driving them away from Christ. This verse bears a lot of similarity to verse Ephesians 4.16, which clearly identifies Christ as the head in multiple places. Now, what do we need to know about this head metaphor? What does it mean for Christ to be the head? Well, clearly it can mean uh, it's an image that, that has some type of language of authority. So Ephesians 1.22 uses the language of Christ being the head to talk about Him being one of authority and empowerment. That the church is bought only by the blood of Jesus Christ and that no one has authority over a congregation except Jesus, the Son of God, who's sent into the world to die on a bloody cross and conquer every other authority. Clearly Jesus has authority and power over the church. He, he was the one that bought it. But verse 19, I don't think, is really a focus on authority, but rather one as a source of growth. Being remaining fast to the head means source of growth. Without the head, life leaves quickly, right? Have you ever run into a snake in your garden? And as you're working in the garden, you realize that black thing over there isn't just a stick. For many people, this is very terrifying including my wife. Well, what happens when you take that shovel in your hand and you lop off that snake's head? Yeah, the body still, the body still moves around for a bit, but it's certainly and definitively dead. There's no chance that that snake might make it somehow. Once the head has been severed, life ceases. It's the same with the church. If a body of people, if the body that we call the church removes Christ as their head, they are by definition no longer a church. A church that does not have Christ as its head is dead and lifeless. Just like the headless snake, there may be movements that resemble life, but without Christ's headship in the church, there is nothing truly living there. Growth ceases to come from God. So verses 16 through 19 communicate two clear truths. That Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and that Jesus is the head of the church. Therefore, Paul is urging them, back to our main point, disregard human commands that do not foster true growth in Christ, who is the fulfillment of the law and head of the church. So disregard the food laws, because in Mark 7, 19, which we've already covered in Mark's gospel, the, Jesus declared all foods clean. Forsake visions because they only serve to increase pride. Disregard the Sabbath because it serves only to point to the rest that we already have in Christ. Disregard human commands and listen only to divine commands. There are plenty of those that we can't live up to anyway. Take this one, for instance, Titus 3, 2. Show perfect courtesy toward all people. 
You think you got that one down yet? Certainly not. So how does this first section carry over to us in North Carolina in 2020? Well, first, you must read your Old Testament differently. Seek to understand how the law is a shadow, how the substance belonged to Christ. Just how in the image that we began with, with the man, with the picture of his fiancée on the table beside him, that picture changes in value and changes in purpose as he now marries that woman. Likewise, for us, part of the new covenant, the image this is, the Old Testament is merely a shadow. It only points us back towards Christ and increases our love and awe and worship of Christ. See how the New Testament interprets and reads the Old Testament and try to replicate and read that way. Most of the doctrinal issues that Paul deals with in all of his epistles, including this one, go back to how do you understand and read the Old Testament. You see, false teachers weren't just creating their own doctrine out of nowhere. No, they were reading the Old Testament and misinterpreting it. Therefore, when you, you should read your Bible carefully and know that how you interpret it can be the difference between true, do, true doctrine that leads to life and false doctrine that can lead to hell. Second, avoid practices that fuel arrogance. See, that's what they were doing. They were, they were using visions. They were using things to be able to, to put themselves up on religious pedestals where they would have authority over others. Most Baptists in America don't struggle with bringing the Old Testament in in the same way the first century did. But we may replicate some similar practices of the false teachers in Colossae. Have you ever heard someone claim, God told me to do it? God told me to do this? They hold tightly on to these words because who would dare challenge the Word of God? Did God actually tell you to move there, to take this or that job, or to make this or that decision in the church? When we do this, we are actually acting like the false teachers who use some spiritual experience to gain spiritual authority where no one can challenge us because we're invoking the Word of God in a way that we do not have authority to do. Don't use this phrase to, to gain spiritual authority. Be honest with people. Tell people what you actually mean. That you prayed about this decision. That you sought the Lord's will and knowledge. That you, that you sought His knowledge and wisdom in the Scriptures. That you spent time in prayer asking God for wisdom. And this is the decision that is the best that you can make. Be honest with people. Don't claim that God said something when He did not. Pay attention to what God did say in Scripture. I don't think he, he intends to audibly answer every question we have. If, if He intended to do that, why would He have given us a book like Proverbs, which is a book full of wisdom on how to live in His world? I don't think He would have given us all of Scripture that tells us how we need to live in light of the Gospel, that gives us all we need for life and godliness, if we were simply just to wait for Him to speak every decision into our ears. And don't, at the same time, don't hear me say that God no longer speaks. He certainly does. I just want to urge people not to claim spiritual authority based on false pretenses like the false teachers in Colossae. Lastly, David Garland, a commentator, pointed out the danger of losing connection with the head. We can only experience and grow in our salvation only within the church, where we are dependent on Christ as head and source of our nourishment and interconnected to one another. You see how the image, if we disconnect ourselves from the church and the body, that we no longer get the growth that comes from the head? We cannot disconnect ourselves from the church and expect to be able to experience Christ and the growth that comes with connection to the church without being part of a church. So if you want growth from God, recognize your need for the body of Christ, the church. Submit to the church. Seek meaningful membership. Hold each other accountable and mortify sin together. Seek holiness together. Now the last three verses. The last three verses, we see that in Christ, the believer has died to the world and the flesh. 
In Christ, the believer has died to the world in the flesh. Paul starts the section that this section is intimately tied with what we've just read, but it's also intimately tied with what comes after that we're not going to deal with this morning. So if you'll look over in your Bibles to chapter 3, verse 1, I want you to see just the beginning of this verse. Chapter 3, verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ... If then you have been raised with Christ. Now go look back at verse 20. If with Christ you died. You see the connection there? He's starting a theological argument based on their salvation. If they have died, then this. If you have been raised, then this. That's what he's doing here. So we're just going to take the first part of this theological argument. Paul turns here in, in saying that in Christ the believer has died to the world and the flesh. So the Colossians were being told, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. The Colossians were beginning to submit to some of these elements of the false teaching. They were submitting to human teaching, not divine teaching. Now it's extremely unlikely that the false teachers presented their teaching in this way. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. But likely Paul is recounting it in a way that's ironic. Meaning something like this. These false teachers run around trying to keep you from even tasting anything. And even to touch it would to be a sin. This is ridiculous for Paul for three reasons. The rules have to do with matters of the world. The rules reflect human and not divine teaching. And the rules cannot bring spiritual transformation. So if you're dead to the world, then these matters of the world don't matter. The rules reflect a human teaching, not divine teaching. It's not from God. And then two, these, these rules, even if you were to follow them to the T, they could never bring you any growth and any spiritual transformation. In Mark 7, Jesus deals with Pharisees and their traditions and their commandments. If you remember this from probably a couple months ago, we read this story in, in Mark chapter 6. The Pharisees asked Jesus why his disciples do not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but instead they eat with unwashed hands. Jesus responds to them, quoting Isaiah 29, 13, where he says this, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And Jesus finished by saying, You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of man. The Colossians had submitted to human traditions, human commands that had nothing to do with following Jesus. Paul reminds them that if you have died with Christ, then you are no longer alive to these commands. The only commands you need or divine commands. So all the commands of the false teachers and the Pharisees, for that matter, are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. That's what the final verse says in this passage. These indeed have an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. So you could hold to all of these rules, all of these commandments, and do them perfectly, but they mean nothing in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. You, know, you want to know what stops the flesh? Not asceticism. Jesus stops the flesh. The true Jesus demands people to see themselves for the, who they are. The gospel stops the flesh. The gospel demands that you cannot work for your salvation because all of your works are filthy rags to the Lord. Salvation does not come through regulations and rules. It comes through the gospel. I want to present the gospel in a way that's adapted from something that J.I. Packer said. So what must one do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus. Well, what does it mean to believe on the Lord Jesus? It means knowing oneself to be a sinner and Christ to have died for sinners, abandoning all self-righteousness and self-confidence and casting oneself wholly upon Him for pardon and peace and exchanging one's natural enmity and rebellion against God for a spirit of grateful submission to the will of Christ through the renewing of one's heart by the Holy Spirit. To further the question, how am I to go about believing on Christ and repenting if I have no natural ability to do these things? 
Well, look to Christ. Speak to Christ. Cry to Christ just as you are. Confess your sin, your impenitence, your unbelief, and cast yourself on His mercy. Ask Him to give you a new heart, working in your true repentance and firm faith. Ask Him to take away your evil heart of unbelief and to write His law on your heart. Turn to Him. Trust Him as best that you can and pray for grace and turn to Him and trust more thoroughly. Watch, pray, read, hear God's Word, worship and commune with God's people. And so continue till you know yourself to be beyond a doubt, indeed a changed being, a penitent believer. Call upon Christ directly. You want to stop the flesh that constantly desires sin? Look to Christ. Believe in the promises of Jesus, that the promise Jesus offers through salvation. That's the way we stop the flesh. So why does this text matter? What do these false teachers and Paul's word of rebuke have to do with us? Well, I'll tell you, the word of the Bible stands as piercing today as they did years ago. And we here as Unity Baptist Church need to hear the words of Scripture in order for us to remain fast to the head. You today need this just as the Colossians did to disregard human commands that do not foster growth in Christ, who is the fulfillment of the law and head of the church. You need to understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and thus transform your reading and understanding of the Old Testament Scriptures. You need to understand that Jesus is the head and ruler and authority and the one that gives growth to this church and no one else. We must reject practices that fuel spiritual arrogance. Now how do we do this? You see, we like human commands. We like ones that we can, we can put on a list and check off. That's what we like to do. We can tell ourselves not to eat cer certain kinds of foods and we cannot eat them. We can create strict rules around holidays like Halloween and we can keep them. You see, these regulations we can follow and we can even look spiritual while doing it. We look wise, we look humble, but in reality it's only self-made religion if it's human commands. It is of no value for following Christ. And none of this is to say that Christianity is without commands. You see, belief in Christ involves complete obedience to Jesus and His commands. The difference is the origin of the command. Human traditions and human teachings are worthless, but divine teaching found in Scripture is of eternal value. So what's the takeaway? Seek the Scriptures. Do this individually and do it here together in unity. Do it one another at each other's houses during the week. Seek and trust God together and trust His Word as we, the body of Christ, hold each other accountable. Next, be on guard against anything that judges and disqualifies others according to human measures. Christian groups these days are wanting to draw tighter and tighter circles around what's acceptable and what's not. This, while sometimes there's a desire to be pure and holy, can be rooted in not divine commands but human commands. As we seek to draw lines and to make the circle tighter, we must constantly be filtering those lines through Scripture. Believers today may prohibit alcohol, dancing, or particular kinds of dress that, that cannot really be found in conflict to be in Scripture. So we here at Unity must constantly be examining our practices. Do they, do they pass the test of Scripture? Do they actually align with holiness and humility? Or are they simply regulations that puff ourselves up? Lastly, treasure Christ. Jesus is your only source of hope. What do you have without Him? Anything you might name is rendered useless because of Judgment Day. Jesus has joyously provided salvation and you ought to joyously receive it. Jesus is so important that the entire Old Testament, the entire law is about Him. It is merely a shadow and Jesus is the substance. Jesus is the reason we don't have to follow it in the same way anymore. And not only that, He is the fulfillment of something in the past. He is the head of the church in the present. Remain tied to Jesus for growth. Stop seeking any religious, religious shadow. Seek Christ, who is the light itself that will never become a shadow. Pray with me. Father, how often we forsake you 
to run after some command that we have made up. How often are we like the false teachers who create our own set of rules in order to make ourselves look good? How often do we make our own set of rules such that we can gain authority over others in the church, present ourselves as leaders, present ourselves as those that should be listened to when really we are nothing? God, may we as Unity Baptist Church only listen to the teaching of your word. God, implant it into our hearts. Use this time of, of the invitation such that we would be able to dwell on it even more. That we would repent of the sins that we have in our life. That we would believe once again in you to be the only source of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.